The Local Youth Worker is a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. Since 1972, RYM has sought to reach and equip youth for Christ. And this podcast seeks to reach and equip those parents and youth workers who share that same desire. For more information on our student conferences, youth leader training, or resources, visit rym.org. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Local Youth Worker, a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. I'm your host, John Pirrett. Uh, this is episode 373, and I'm here with Chris Holland. Chris, how's it going? It's going to 373. That's awesome. <laughs> wow. Yeah, man. Um, That's a special 373 is a special episode. Well, it is because you're on it. Yeah. Joining us. From I wasn't going to Arizona. say that. <laughs> no, I know you're setting it up for that. I could tell. Yeah. So, you know. but, but good. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> Chris, I know you and I, we're, we're going to talk about uh, managing a staff in just a little bit. Um, looking forward to getting into that conversation. Um, right now, uh, Kurt kind of set this up a few episodes ago, uh, talking about travel tips for youth workers. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this, put you on the spot. Do you have any idea how many youth trips you've been on in your lifetime as a youth worker? <laughs> just as a youth worker or just including just, me as a youth? Just as a youth uh... worker. 12 years plus time, 12 years times, probably somewhere <laughs> around 70, 60, 70. I mean, oh, if you include goodness. mission trips, I used to take two mission trips per year. And yeah, I'm trying to ski trips, you know, RYM middle school, RYM high school, mm-hmm. uh, apologetics camp in St. Louis every year, um, oh, man. London. Um, that's a, it could be six per year times 12. 72 um let's pare down because covid cut that down so maybe around 50 to 60. okay so a good bit um so you've got some some wisdom to speak into this um yeah what what are some travel tips that come to mind um after all of your youth trips you've been on (laughs) okay go get the largest zip ties you can get okay go get the largest zip ties you can get if you're taking a van like a rental van or whatever you need at least two but bring four in case one of them breaks go get a tv mount that goes on a 32 inch flat screen tv and put it in there make sure it's got holes you can run the zip ties through and you zip attach that to a flat screen tv then zip tie the tv mount and the tv to the front two seats the driver's seat and the passenger side (laughs) seat then go get two inverters right that'll turn your you know your plug in the car two separate ones into enough amperage to run the tv and an xbox get an xbox and put that between the seats get four controllers and go have the time of your life (laughs) on your trip like we do this every time you don't have to talk to your students the whole time (laughs) but they're not talking to you anyway (laughs) even if they like because we ban you know kids from bringing phones on a good number of our trips but Um, it's actually one of those things, I don't know if I should admit this in public, but it's one of, like, where I was in the passenger seat one time and I said, give me that controller. And they handed me the controller and I couldn't see. And I was like, now guide me and tell me where to go to shoot people. And so I couldn't <laughs> see, but the guys in the back, and that was probably one of the most fun things ever, you know? And so like, it's, it's just, and anyway, it's just good old fashioned fun. And every once in a while you turn it off and talk and whatever. That's an amazing travel tip. And I should have known, I mean, as, you know, just tech savvy as you are, that it'd be something about zip tying a flat screen to, to headrest in, in a van. That, that's impressive. I'm so sure. you got four zip ties because the two are for the TV. Mm-hmm. One is if one of those breaks and the fourth is for that really ornery kid that you have. That's Of course. Call yes. their parents first since yeah, I'm zip tying them to the bunk bed. <laughs> and then, you know, go home with your day. Man, that, that's impressive. Um, and I'm sure, you know, as you had all that rigged up and your students show up and they see that, they just lose their mind um, because they see this flat screen uh, rigged up. So that's that's a great travel tip. Um, well, Chris, uh, like I said, you and I will be talking about uh, managing a staff in just a, a minute. Um, just reminding our listeners, we're still settling back into the um, 
uh, always the variety show aspect of this, uh, breaking it up into segments. Of course, we've got this introductory segment, but we'll we'll have something coming up soon. Um, as I've already kind of teased it out, we'll be talking something about fears of a minister. Um, Brian Habig will be joining us um, for several episodes to talk about that, um, and we'll have other youth workers come on to discuss that. Um, as well as some other potential guests. We'll also uh, we'll have Rebecca McLaughlin coming on uh, before too long. Uh, she'll be joining us again. She's been on the podcast before, uh, but talking about one of her new books. Um, we're excited as well to be announcing that Paul David Tripp will be coming on this podcast. Um, Who is that? <laughs> I don't know. I think he's written a book or two. Um, but, uh, but he will be coming on. Um, <laughs> we're excited because he does not do a lot of podcasts. And so he'll be coming on this podcast to talk about, uh, who he was as a teenager. Um, he was excited to kind of get that opportunity because a lot of people don't know who Paul David Tripp was as a teenager. So looking forward to talking to him about that. But for now, here's my interview with Chris. Chris, good to see you, man. Yeah, you too. Um, how, how was your summer? I, I feel like, you know, right as the summer was getting started, I saw you in Colorado, so we got to see each other briefly. Um, but a lot is, has happened since Colorado. Uh, just talk a little bit about that. Did, did you get to do any other youth trips, mission trips, anything like that? Dude, this is the fir- probably the first summer in t- like it's it's been a, the first time in a long time that it felt like it really actually flew by hmm. really fast. Um, this summer, you know, we hired seven different interns to come into town and help us with our youth ministry. And wow. uh, it was a really mixed bag. So three of those were recent graduates out of high school. I think out of that, we learned we probably need to hire people after they've been in college for a year. <laughs> if you can't come to a lot of the, like the intern retreat for four days at the very beginning, you can't come to a lot of the, to the school things before school lets out in the local high schools and middle schools to go visit kids before summer starts and generate some just momentum with them. Couldn't come to our super week, which is our first, you know, camp of like week long camp of summer that we do on our campus in our field and our facility. And uh, then they jump in right before RYM Colorado, which is awesome, but there's a whole lot of movement and growth at the intern team that they can't coalesce together that doesn't happen if you're not able to be at those events and things. Um, and, and super week is one of those times where you get to know every kid's name and, Mm -hmm. and just a weird, fun context wrestling over oily watermelons and whatnot. (laughs) So it's a, it's a really advantageous time for people to be there, but I felt like this summer in particular was the fastest summer I've ever experienced in my life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it, it kind of can sound cliched, you know, just, oh, it flew by. Um, but it, it's feeling more and more like that every every passing year. Um, so, yeah, t- I, I do want to stop you. Okay, Super Week, um, why don't you give us just a, a little bit of an overview? What What is Super Week as you're talking about that? Yeah, so Super Week is kind of a byproduct gift of COVID. So when that came out, all of our camps were canceled. So um we couldn't go to RYM because parents were afraid to go to, you know, a group large gathering. I think a lot of the RYMs were shut down too. And mm-hmm. we couldn't go to the camps that exist here in North um, Arizona that we typically could. And so we're like, well, let me just hire a bunch of my old youth that just graduated from high school. So we had 10, uh, 10 youth to fly out here and be interns. So they're kind of like an archetype of an internship program that now we have three years later, but uh, so they came out and we created a camp, um, out of the air that was coming basically an RYM template, come in in the morning at eight, play a bunch of fun games, gather, sing some songs, go to two separate class breakout groups between sixth and seventh grade, and then eighth and ninth grade. Uh, and our pastors taught those classes on just various things. How do I know if I'm saved? What really is sin and what really, is, how do I know X, Y, Z? So just, you know, hot topic kind of very practical things. Then uh, somewhere around 1030, because we are in the desert and in the summer, it does get around 110, 115 degrees, go out to the field and play water games and just big mixer games. So if you've gone to RYM middle school, you know, you have the the big uh, rallies that they have out on the mm-hmm. beach and whatnot. It's very much like that. We totally stole those ideas from RYM because they're good. I, I doubt RYM was the first to do something. <laughs> <like that. laughs> Centrifuges. I don't know. But um. 
so yeah so that's what we did and then at 12 o'clock every day the the youth would leave interns would clean up and then those nights we would do different events with the high school so it could be an outreach project it could go down to the inner city it could do you know just do different things with the high school so it was just a super week it's just super tiring super fun super big as far as you know you're trying to create story and um with, within your youth group and then that story lends itself to tradition and to culture of the youth group mm-hmm. and so it did all of those accomplished all those things and set us up for a really successful and effective uh, summer hmm. man and you might have said this and i just missed it and all that did do students just go home in the evenings and stay at their house or do they stay in host homes how do you guys do that no, we didn't do the disciple now thing, you know, where they stay in host homes. But the uh, so the middle school would come at eight. They would leave at 12 noon. They would go home. Interns would clean up and get everything ready for high school. And then each night on during that week, we would do a separate event with high school. So it could be like an outreach thing. And then at, you know, nine or 10, I mean, summertime. So high school stays late. Uh, then the high school would leave and go home afterwards. And then we would start the whole thing off. Again, where the the middle school would come back up to the church at eight the next morning. And then the final day, we went to this big water park that's super Republican. So they're like, COVID's nothing or, <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> and so they're, uh, they, they remained open up in Phoenix. And so we all went for an entire day there. Then we did a closing ceremony on the last day. We included all the parents there. I mean, we had around a hundred and something. I don't know. You know, we were a little bit of youth group when I got here of like six kids, but we remained open through that summer and it just, it boosted our attendance a lot. And uh, so all the parents came, we had big food and it was really fun. Um, and we gave out awards for kids for random, random things. And so it was just a really good, effective thing to do. Well, so now we do it every summer. Yeah. Um, and it's cool too, just, uh, you know, as we, we think about, COVID and, you know, still around. Um, but, uh, the, so many people had to pivot because of that in different ways. And I mean, speaking specifically about ministry here, it's so cool to hear of something like super week that has now become part of your church and tradition and all of that, um, because of this, you know, horrible thing that, that occurred. Um, so it's just, it's awesome to pause and reflect on, okay, the, the good that did come, um, from this. So, um, that's that's encouraging to hear. Uh, any, any other highlights from the summer? You had Super Week. You did RYM Colorado, and it was awesome to see you in person. Um, uh, what else from the summer? I mean, Colorado is always a high point, and I've said this on the podcast before. If you haven't taken your group, you know, every summer, every four summers, depending on your location, to RYM Colorado, you have to. And it's just an experience. I mean, to get to play in the snow on the free day in the middle of <laughs> summer – on a beautiful mountain surrounded by snow cap, like there's an experience. Incredible. The hills truly are alive, right? And so, it's a it's a wonderful experience to take your youth to. You're totally separate from the world. You don't get good cell phone service. Like it's just, I mean, I caught I caught a trout in the little <laughs> like I went down and got a license at the little uh, outdoor store with one of my youth who's never gone fishing before, and we caught wow. a trout at that little stream. You know, that's in, at the entrance yeah. of the gate. Yeah. And we caught a trout within like 15 minutes. And like, he was just overcome with emotion about catching it. And I was too, it was super cool. But um, you get to do things there that you normally can't do Mm -hmm. and experience things with a backdrop of just beauty that you don't normally have. And so you you need to do that. Um, You know, after that, we, we ask our interns and our youth staff to take a mandatory vacation the first week of July on July 4th week. That allows me and my wife and my family to regroup and have time together. And uh, then after that, you just jump back in. So every, every week has a Monday night event for high school, a Friday night event for middle school, a midweek event on Wednesday night for everybody. And then on Sunday nights, we were going down to uh, South Tucson, which is kind of our lower income uh, community and doing sports camp every Sunday night uh, with our interns and a few of the youth that we had hand chosen to come with us that really we felt like they could do a good job ministering to the, to the kids that are in that community. Uh, and, and so it just flew by. Then we do our own middle school camp uh, in North, or we usually do it in Northern Arizona, but this year we did it in San Diego, right outside of the city. And I mean, it was awesome at Pine Valley. It was super good, but we have to create everything. Ben Melchers, who's been on the yeah. show before. Uh, he was my guest speaker. Hey, uh, he's had, out in Palo Alto, California, just to remind our listeners. 
And Ben is solid. If you need a good guest guest speaker that's on the West Coast, like if you're a listener in that area, Ben's really great. Um, and then a guy named Philip Vo, who just got he's working on an album. I don't know if I can talk about it, but anyway, so he's working on some important stuff and he just killed it in the music. And then again, we pretty much stole RYM's model for how to do camps. <laughs> hey, we love it, man. That's, <laughs> so, yeah, happy to I mean, share it. Don't recreate the wheel, man. Uh, <laughs> and so it just, it lended itself to being a very busy summer and we've just started schools back and I'm kind of sad because I don't get that as much free time, you know, with my mm-hmm, students mm-hmm. as I did before, but it just flew by, man. Like it just, it's crazy how fast it went. Yeah, man. Well, um, I definitely want to be in your youth group after hearing all that. Um, it sounds. It costs money. It costs money. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, look, I, I do want to talk about it. I mean, this is a good segue. You, you mentioned um, seven interns that worked for you this summer. Um, a lot of what I, I want to focus the rest of our time on talking about is managing a staff. Um, I know you've been in the youth ministry game for a while. You were in Fairhope, Alabama prior to this, and now you've been in Tucson, Arizona. Um, so I, I'd love to talk about managing a staff. Um, I know for a while there, there was a time, uh, speaking, you know, personally, uh, there, there was a time where it was just me on staff <laughs> in youth ministry. And then I, I gradually started to have more staff and began to manage a staff and loved it. And sincerely, um, all the people I've worked with, we're, we're friends to this day and we still keep up. And, um, but you realize, okay, when you start managing a staff, there's some new work for you that you didn't have. You think, okay, th- they can help you with a lot of work and they're going to be able to kind of multiply what you can do. Uh, but there's also now something else in my schedule. Um, not to sound crass, these are people. <laughs> so another part of my, you know, routine and calendar, everything that these people take up. Um, so why don't you just start uh, talking a little bit about kind of managing a staff? Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that you still talk to some of your old staff because a lot of times in, um, you know, the secular world, being a manager is almost like dating somebody. After you split up or they leave, you can't ever talk to them again, and it's awkward. You know, that's but that's true. kind of a testimony to your to who you are that your staff still talk with you. Um, not, not to say that my old staff, my interns don't. Um, we've been very blessed that I've felt a lot, and we've just been we've hired a lot of very gracious, patient people to work with me. <laughs> Because I, I failed a lot at this, but um, I do think that, yeah, like you said, that is a kind of a testament to good management and uh, leadership. Uh, if you're managing people, you need to reconcile within yourself this idea. I, as your manager, have to make your job clear. I have to make your objectives clear, and I have to make your leadership clear. So who you answer to has to be very clear, and then your compensation has to be very, very clear. All those things need to be written down and you need to tell people you are the best manager of this information in this system. You only answer to me, but you need to stay on top of your job description because I don't know what's going on in your life. I want to know and, you know, and we'll grow in, as friends and all this other stuff, but you're the best manager of those three things, right? And stay on top of that. If you're not getting paid what you're supposed to get with me and I'll fix it. If I'm capitalizing all your time and soaking up your personal life, you need to let me know that and we'll fix it. Um, and so you just need to manage that. Another piece of management in uh, youth ministry in particular is uh, uh, you're calling people to come and work with you in ministry. So a primary job of a manager in ministry, a leader in ministry, you want to untie the hands of the people God has brought to you to allow them to be freed up to do the work that God has called them to. And so a lot of that work, like you mentioned it before, I call that stress hours. It's how many stress hours is it going to cost me to invest in you to do the job that we've hired you to do and that God's called you to do. And so if I have a certain level of stress hours, I have to, uh, you know, put that in the equation of who I'm hiring to get things done. Uh, For instance, with an intern, I have a lot less stress hours on an intern I've hired in the past. And, you know, versus someone with a a lot more effort, I'm going to have to put into somebody who's brand new. But then you also have another piece of the equation. Well, what if like this summer we had four interns returning from the previous summer? If I can tell those four interns that have been here, minister to the other three, 
that haven't been here, that reduces my stretch hours because I'm delegating those responsibilities. I'm, I'm kind of spreading the load, which you need to do in leadership. Um, and so it, it, it can be tricky and it takes a, a good bit of time and experience in doing that. But if you really can have a philosophy of I exist to untie your hands for you to do the job God's called you to, then I think that that person that you hire will feel empowered. They'll feel cared about. They'll feel like this person believes in me because you do. I mean, you hired them because you believe in them. You believe they're going to do that, that job and fulfill that calling they've been called to. And if you're really doing an adequate job of that in, in leading, uh, then I think it's going to work out well. And I think you're going to be able to talk to them every so often mm-hmm. and see them at general assembly or at RYM camp or various things, or maybe one day they come and visit your church and, and whatever you become deeper friends, whatever. But um, if you have that idea and you have that paradigm that you're coming into it, that relationship, I think you're going to do a lot better. Mm-hmm. Uh, that goes without saying though. I mean, you experience this too. The more man, more staff you have, the more office time you're usually spending and so you have to realize, yes, you're getting more help, but chances are that shrinks the number of kids you're able to meet throughout the week. That shrinks the number of parent meetings you're able to have. That shrinks the amount of time you're able to counsel families. And it shrinks. So the, the larger your staff, the less boots of less time your boots are going to get on the ground yeah. in the field. So yeah, yeah. that's kind of so- how I, I deal with it. Yeah, you said a ton of good stuff. I want to I want to come back to the stress hours um, in just a minute. But going back to, I think the first thing you were talking about is is clarity, and to me, I mean that that is such a good word that just encompasses so much of what you do as a manager. Because what I had to to realize is that more often than not, when my staff below me was failing it was because of me <laughs> that uh, there, there's some humility we have to have to realize, okay, the reason they're failing is because I was not clear in my expectations of them. Um, but whatever the task was, whatever it was, if there was some kind of, you know, misunderstanding for our programs on a Wednesday night, if something didn't get done, it's like, you know what? It's because I did not tell you this, or I did not clearly say, this is actually what I want you to do. In this and so clarity is a, a massive um, aspect of the job of a manager. You know, another aspect too, John, is sometimes it's not your fault. <laughs> sometimes <laughs> yes, you just gotta sure. fire somebody and say, "I love you." And and you know, I've had this a few times where I'm not the kind of person unless you're you you have a serious moral failure. You're you're doing something seriously morally wrong seriously ethically wrong you're you're running a casino table in the back of the youth building and you know <laughs> benefiting off of the ignorance of children or whatever but like um unless it's something serious egregious right you're, you're probably not going to immediately fire somebody so let's say you have a staff person who is just not getting out of it they're just they're just not giving themselves fully to the work to earn the dollar that you're paying them to do what you've asked them to do well, that could be any number of things. I mean, it really, depression is a real thing, right? Um, anxiety is a real thing. Uh, mourning, uh, the loss of someone can take time. It depends on a lot of the different things that are going on in a person's life, especially in youth ministry. You're Nine times out of 10, you're going to hire a young person that's just not super mature and holding a job. And less and less kids these days are getting jobs through high school and through college. And so if they're coming on your staff, especially full time, chances are they've never had a full time job or a boss before. And they don't really know what that language and the lingo lingo is or how to confirm a d- directive from their manager or their boss. You, they don't know that. And so a lot of that learning they're getting from you. And so that's a really beautiful thing, but it's a scary thing, like raise them up in the way they should go and they'll be faithful to continue in it. Well, the flip of that, right? Every pat we've heard a million pastors preach it is the flip is if you raise them up in the wrong way, they'll continue in it too. And management is kind of the same way, like parenting. And so being very clear with them. So let's say you have somebody who is uh, not showing up to things. And then when they're there, they're just on their phone, right? And they're supposed to be hanging out with kids. Like, and this is going to happen mm-hmm. uh, inevitably, you know? And so, Let's say the first thing is you pull them aside in the same way you would a kid who's acting up in youth group and say, Hey, what's going on? How are you doing? Like, 
investigate their life. Try to get a deeper picture, a better picture of what's going on. And you just ask questions. Hey, what's going on? You, you're all right, man. Cause like you're on your phone during the Bible studies and um, you're not really paying attention in a small group with the kids. The kids said you weren't really engaged. Are, are you all right? Is everything okay? Like is there anything I need to pray for you with or like anything like this investigate if it's no no man i'm cool i'm cool whatever whatever okay well you can only help someone as much as they mm-hmm. let you in yeah but if it continues at some point you have to because you're not trying to get information out of them you're really trying to help the person you go back to them if it continues and maybe they they stop showing up on time or they stop showing up altogether. hey like this is just not characteristic of you you know two months ago three months ago a year ago whatever you were johnny on the spot with this stuff like what's going on Let's talk. I want to be there for you. If they still don't let you in, then you have to just take it uh, kind of in a vacuum and say, well, I need you to be here at this time. And if you're not here at this time, I have to, you know, go to the next step. And I want to be with you and walk with you through it. But, you know, I want if you're not going to let me in or whatever, then I just have to handle it kind of cold turkey like this. If they do it again, I think it's okay to come to them and say, okay. What's going on? You always start with that. If they still say nothing, man. Okay. I have to let you go. And you kind of saw this coming, right? And chances are they did. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. You know, it's just not working out. It doesn't seem like you want to be here, but I need somebody needs to be here. X, Y, Z. I love you. Do you have any questions about that? Like you kind of left me no choice. I don't really know where to go from here. If you, if you do let somebody go, you do need to let your, your management, your person over, you know, that that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. It should not be a shock to them if you come to them one day and say, yeah, I had to let Johnny go or whatever. Um, it shouldn't be a shock to them. Yeah, I'm sorry. It worked out that way. And follow up with them after that happens, too. Mm-hmm. It's really, yeah. really important. Well, and something I want to say is is just you demonstrated a great management tip um, there uh, is, you know, using the example of of the phone not just jumping in and going to the the staff member and saying, why are you on your phone? Um, you, you said, how are you doing? Uh, that That's an awesome way to enter into that because you're treating them like a person. You're, you're treating them as a fellow image bearer uh, that we have to see, you know, if you're in a position of management to not lose sight of that because we can be so task oriented and so, okay, this is what I'm wanting them to do. This is what I hired you for that we lose the humanity of the individual and so to, to, to go in that way is not just, you know, a sneaky way to uh, avoid conflict or manipulation or whatever. Um, you really need to pray that your heart would, would be, you know, treating this person on that level, thinking of them on that level of, hey, how are you? You doing okay? And like you said, there can often be something deeper there and there can be real depression and anxiety and it could be that question that just the the floodgates open and they do open up and they share this and then you realize okay you know what the you know them being on their phone is something we can deal with later um, or maybe not deal with at all because there's other stuff going on and so um yeah i think that's just an awesome tip that, that people need to realize those in management and and i do want to follow up and just ask you um, have you had to fire somebody, Chris? Yes, I have. <laughs> and then what was their name? I'm kidding. No, um, <laughs> John <sorry>. Pierre. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the big reveal. All I wanted was hot coffee with two sugars. <laughs> <laughs> Is that too much to ask? <laughs> um, no, I, I'd love for you, you know, as much as you, as much as you can. I mean, obviously we cannot go into a lot of detail, but um, some thoughts on that, what, what you learned from that, but just any, any detail you can share that could be helpful here. Yeah. I mean, I think it, I took the same steps, but this was somebody that was a really close friend to me that I hired. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so they, they dropped the ball on a number of different things. And it was a kind of, it was a situation where they didn't know why they didn't have drive at the beginning of the job. They just excited they're there early stayed late. And then slowly over the course of three to four months, they just kind of tipped off the scales and just took it easy. I mean, and it's easy to do that in a ministry job because you, you pretty much create your own schedule. Yeah. You create your own lineup and, and you have to be a self-starter and initiator and really motivated to do that. Uh, a calling, even if you're super called into ministry, you can go through seasons where you're like, I just have a hard time hanging out with people. Uh, introverts are called into John Piper is an introvert, right? Mm-hmm. Like 
it, people are called into ministry that are introverts to preach and teach and lead people, disciple X, Y, Z. So that's not necessarily a characteristic of somebody you shouldn't hire. In youth ministry, we usually profile people that are introverts as not hireable in youth ministry, but I've found really great success in, in those introverts and in those people getting outside of themselves and taking that step towards something that's scary and then growing through it. And we've been able to contribute to their spiritual growth and their story. That's a beautiful thing. But when somebody gets on the horse and is riding hard and then three months later, they just stop showing up to things for my situation was they did, this person didn't show up to the second event that they had planned <laughs> and I showed up and then I had to organize it out of the air and make it happen. And uh, the parent came in the next day that saw kind of what was happening. And uh, she said, can I talk to you? I was like, sure. And I said, can this person sit in with us? They're learning how to do ministry. And the parent ripped me a new one and I took the blame. Cause it is like you said, it is my, ultimately it's my fault. I should have managed better. It, it falls down on me. I'm the face of the ministry here. So I'll, I'll take the blame. And she ripped me a new one and, it, and she was righteous in it. Hmm. Uh, but I didn't let him say that it was his fault. And I just took the blame. So when she left, he got very emotional and was like, I am so sorry. And it's like, no, 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 I didn't do this to shame you. I did it so that you could see kind of this is the weight of even little events like this with, with a couple middle schoolers. They're still really heavy to the ones who care about it. And you need to have a greater care for it and a greater vision for it. And when they fall through the cracks, these kind of types of things happen. Uh, a week later, another event fell through the crack. <laughs> I got with him and, and I was like, you know what we're talking about? And he's like, yeah, I do. <laughs> I said, I got to let you go, bro. I love you so much. You're not really letting me in. And so I just have to handle it like this. Like, but I love you so much. And, and, and the thing is, this guy, like, he was off our staff, but he became one of the best volunteers we ever had. Still is mm-hmm. at that church. And like, he's fantastic. He's a great person. And, but afterwards, he's like, yeah, I don't really feel like I'm called in a ministry like I was. And, you know, this experience was really eye opening for me. And, and so it ended well. I haven't ever had a situation where somebody's just like, well, forget you and blah, 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 blah. And I hate the church and I hate God and Jesus. Sucks. Like, I've not had that yet. Maybe I will. I hope not. Mm-hmm. Um, I would imagine, you know, Romans, as much as as much as you were able to get along, get along, that we'd be able to disagree and still get along. Yeah, but uh, sometimes you know I, I haven't had that yet. I think it's maybe because that that counseling type approach. How are you? Uh, is very effective, and, and it's and it's real. That came out of like I really want to yeah. know. It seems like something's going on. If you care about your people, you'll ask them that way. Yeah. But if you're insecure with yourself, and if you start taking on and thinking, well, if this person drops the ball, I look bad. All right. Well, you've got an insecurity issue, right? Because that one little event, it's not going to make or break a, a ministry <laughs> at all, mm. right? Have more patience. But if you can sit down with them like, hey, man, yeah, this fell through the cracks, but how are you doing? That's going to be a lot more effective. Uh, you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. I think well, that's and- a and, and again, just the whole, how are you kind of uh, method of, you know, entering into their lives. Just again, those listening who are in a managerial type position, um, don't just employ that as a tactic. If you really don't care about the people you're managing, pray about your heart. And that's not me, you know, trying to, trying to be harsh. I mean, sincerely, like see these people as people and don't be that harsh manager, be loving because I mean, it is, I mean, just, uh, you know, I, I always struggle to say this, but the, you know, the, the podcast, the, the rise and fall of Mars Hill and Mark Driscoll, all the talk, this, um, that that's been going on around this, this podcast, but it does seem like you're hearing more trends of just kind of the harsh people, um, in churches behind the scenes that treat people this way. And so, um, pray that that will not be true of, of your heart. If you, if you're hearing this, um, Chris, look, Can there's some, please yeah, yeah, interject. Let me throw one other thing too, when you're interviewing people, especially if they're full-time staff, um, we do we do this. We started doing this about seven years ago or so. Um, you need to find out where people that you're hiring with re- where they ultimately feel like they're going to land in ministry. And I've had two people work for me that feel like they're going to land in missions. And so what we did was 
um, kind of thought outside of the box and said, you know what? Um, we believe in you and we want to invest in your future. Not, we don't want to just hire you for a job. We want to hire you to invest in you, who God's made you to be. We want to give you two extra weeks of work vacation, mission vacation, so that you can go do mission trips and you have two weeks to do it in addition to your two weeks or whatever of vacation we're giving you. But those two weeks are designated to just mission trips. And we also want to give you a $1,500 to go towards that. And anything over that, you you have to raise and build a support base. So if you leave us to go on the mission field, you've got a support base to go and do missions more effectively. You've already got a team and you already know how it works. And every year you can you can access that however you would like to. Um, and, and that's just one example. So if somebody's like, yeah, I, I want to be a preaching pastor, but right now I can just be you know, an assistant youth director or assistant to the regional middle, middle school director or whatever, like, okay, well, let's start working on homiletics and you start working with them on, you know, what the tools they're going to be using when they go into that in the future. And that's a fancy word for preaching to those listening, just Basically, throw, yeah. throwing that out there. I just wanted to sound really smart. So <laughs> it's just hard <laughs> to do with the country this. accent, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, you're trying to think about how do I invest in this person's future? Not only how do I get them to do the job and pay them for it, but invest in their future, too. And I think that goes a really long way for showing that you actually do care about what God's doing in the world and as well as in that person. Yeah, I'm really glad you're bringing that up because it, I found that, you know, when I would have staff meetings um, uh, as we, we'd sit down, I mean, one thing that was always fruitful was to just simply ask the staff, what do you like doing? Um, and just really get them to, you know, list, you know, three, five, 10 things that they just like doing. And what you're doing oftentimes through that is you're uncovering their gifting and their calling. And you can typically find, at least for me, I don't know, Chris, I'd like for you to speak to this. You can find ways in which they can utilize those gifts and their roles as, as youth workers. And that's the way, I mean, the kingdom of God should work. That's the way the church should work. And so, um, you know, and I mean, it just fuels their zeal and passion for what you're calling them to do. And so that's just a very basic kind of exercise that can typically be helpful. Um, Chris, I know we're, we're about to be out of time, but I'd love for you to just kind of speak into this and then maybe we'll wrap up. Yeah. I mean, I think I totally agree. The, the last couple of times I've done that with somebody working with me and just said, um, I want to know what makes you excited about ministry. What are those aspects? What makes you excited about meeting with kids? What makes you excited about X, Y, Z? Okay. I want you to use your Myers-Briggs or Enneagram or use your talent, use your experience and your backstory for the glory of God. Go take, like Lindsay, who works with me now, she was a dancer back in the day in ballet. And so what makes you excited? Ballet. Go and do these free ballet classes for kids. You know, and get your small group of girls. I'm like, I know that you hate ballet. You actually play because out here, girls play football with the guys. I know you play football, but ballet could be really fun. And they just, you know, go and use that. And it's like, really, I can do that. Yeah, I want you to have the freedom to go and do that. However, you you're called to. You know, I mean, and we do that as youth ministers all the time. If you like music, you play music with kids. If you like sports, you play sports with the kids. You like Xbox, you play Xbox with the kids. Board games, yes. Board games, everything like. It's one of those things, just use what God, use the story God has given you to minister to who you have. And asking those questions is really, really, really important. And I think there's a lot of freedom in being who you are in that for the glory of God. So, yeah, yeah, definitely. And I, I like the way you said that, use the story God has given you, because, yes, yeah, so often in ministry, I would find that aspects of my story were connecting with other students. And there were times where even, you know, just in God's grace, you'd be able to see, okay, this difficult thing that happened in my life, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, here's how the Lord used that in this specific moment. Um, and so it's always awesome when that happens. Chris, look, there's a ton more that we can talk about. Um, and we, we definitely need to, to pick this up again. Um, but hey, thanks for being a part of this conversation. I know it'll be helpful to others. My pleasure. Without money, oh, come and feast without pay. For the king has opened his banquet hall to the beggar, the outcast, and the slave. For the king has opened his banquet hall to the beggar, the outcast.